When the noble gas helium is liquefied and cooled below 2.17 degrees absolute, it becomes possible to observe certain unique and fascinating physical effects. These phenomena are the properties of a fluid which behaves according to quantum mechanics on a scale directly visible in the laboratory. In our demonstrations with helium, we use liquid nitrogen as a bath in the outer section of a double vacuum flask or doer. In other words, the doer which will hold the helium is inside another vacuum flask containing nitrogen. Liquid coming out of this tube is liquid nitrogen and it's at 77 degrees Kelvin. It's now entering the outer vacuum jacketed vessel and uh, will eventually fill it up. We're about to transfer liquid helium into the inner vacuum jacketed vessel. And uh, the reason it's jacketed is so that it reduces the heat leak from the laboratory. We have liquid nitrogen then, which you can now see coming in along here, outside that vacuum jacket at 77 degrees, so that when the helium looks out, it sees a temperature of 77 degrees instead of the room, which is at 300 degrees. Outside of the nitrogen is another vacuum jacketed vessel or doer, which keeps the nitrogen from seeing the room temperature. Normally all the glassware in here is silvered to further reduce the heat leak, but for these demonstrations we've made it unsilvered so you can see clearly what's going on. Below 2.17 degrees, the so-called lambda point, liquid helium is described as a superfluid. What this really means is that the liquid has two components. One component, the normal one, has the same properties as liquid helium above 2.17 degrees. The other component, called the superfluid component, has the unique properties of a quantum fluid. At normal atmospheric pressure, helium becomes liquid when it is cooled below 4.2 degrees on the Kelvin or absolute scale. This is 269 degrees colder than zero degrees centigrade. At this temperature, 4.2 degrees Kelvin, everything else in the world would be solid. We'll dramatize this by doing the unthinkable in normal lab work, letting air into the doer. The cloud which formed is composed of liquid droplets of air, not water, and the snow is solid crystals of air, not water ice crystals. An interesting sidelight is that the snowstorm in all its stages took only 30 seconds and during this time the crystals of air grew to a size of several millimeters. Now if we cooled the liquid helium below four degrees by pumping on it, we might expect it to freeze eventually before reaching absolute zero, but it does not. Only by applying 25 atmospheres of pressure from the outside, thus bringing the atoms closer together and promoting crystallization, can we make solid helium. As we pump away vapor above the helium, more of the liquid evaporates. This cools the helium just as you are cooled when you get out of a swimming pool on a windy day. Boiling, the formation of bubbles inside the liquid, takes place because the liquid below is hotter than that being cooled from above by evaporation. In fact, the liquid below is superheated. But watch what happens when the temperature falls below 2.17 degrees Kelvin and listen to the sound recorded by a microphone immersed in the boiling helium. It seems that all the liquid helium suddenly reached a uniform temperature. Otherwise, boiling would continue as the temperature decreases. When liquid helium is cooled below 2.17 degrees absolute, the lambda point, or also T lambda, a subtle and profound change of physical state occurs. It is subtle enough to have escaped detection for the first 30 years of the history of liquid helium and profound enough so that liquid helium below T lambda can be said to be in a singular state of matter. Above T lambda, liquid helium is an ordinary liquid obeying ordinary hydrodynamics. Below the lambda point, it is called superfluid helium and behaves as though it has two components. One, a normal fluid component, and the other, a superfluid component. This is the basic idea in the theory of superfluid helium called two-fluid hydrodynamics, which has been 
very successful in explaining the unusual properties of superfluid helium. To repeat, helium below 2.17 degrees is a fluid whose density, rho, equals the density of a superfluid component plus that of a normal component. Each component has its own independent velocities, and the mass flow rate of the liquid as a whole is the sum of the flow rates of the two components. Both the superfluid component and the normal component respond to pressure like any other fluid. That is, they flow from high pressure to low pressure. But the response of the two components to temperature variations is very different, and like that of no other fluids. The normal component flows toward the colder region, while the superfluid component always flows toward the hotter region. But what about the resistance to flow, or viscosity? Normal liquid helium, that is liquid helium above 2.17 degrees Kelvin, has a smaller viscosity than that of any ordinary liquid. The superfluid component has a far smaller viscosity. In fact, its viscosity is not just low, it's zero. Also astonishing, this superfluid component carries zero entropy. In other words, it has no heat content. We understand the uniform temperature of the fluid in the following way. Below T lambda, heat transfer takes place by a counterflow of normal and superfluid component. If there is a hot spot in the liquid, superfluid component flows toward it and dilutes the entropy because it carries none. At the same time, normal fluid component flows away from the hot spot, carrying entropy. Superfluid helium is nature's best heat exchanger. It is a superheat conductor. The powder in this U-tube is so fine and so densely packed that the pores between the grains are only five millionths of a centimeter in diameter, about a tenth the wavelength of light. Such a porous medium immobilizes the flow of the normal fluid component. The superfluid component having zero viscosity can pass through the U-tube with absolutely no resistance. For that reason, the medium inside is referred to as a superleak. First, a glass container is lowered into the helium to fill it. Then it's pulled up and the siphon is lowered into it. The siphon is self-priming. It fills by superfluid film flow and capillary action. The levels equalize in about 30 seconds. If this were done in helium above 2.17 degrees Kelvin, it would take about 30 years rather than 30 seconds to empty the container. The siphon demonstration shows that the viscosity of the superfluid component is at least seven orders of magnitude smaller than that of non-superfluid helium. Actually, the container would have emptied in a few hours even without the siphon. The superfluid component flowing without viscosity would climb up the walls of the container in a thin film. In other words, this superfluid film would act like a siphon. But there are other complications with the siphon because temperature changes also affect the motion of superfluid helium. The flowing superfluid carries no entropy, that is, no heat leaves the container. But since the mass left behind has decreased, its entropy per unit mass, and therefore its temperature, rises. But superfluid component flows toward a hotter region, in this case, the right of the siphon just as it tends to flow toward the low pressure region at the left of the siphon. So the flow should reach an equilibrium and stop at some point. But as we demonstrated earlier, it did not stop, and the reason has to do with evaporation. As helium in the container heats up, some of it evaporates, thereby cooling the remaining liquid. This prevents any temperature difference which could stop the flow. If the top of the container were closed, this cooling could not occur, and the flow would grind to a halt, as it does in the next demonstration, which is a version of a classic experiment performed by Peter Kapitza in 1941 in Moscow. This experiment proved two separate and important properties of the superfluid component. We use a plexiglass test tube stoppered at the lower end by superleaks so that only the superfluid component can flow in or out of the test tube. 
Above the super leaks is an electrical resistor. When we pass current through the resistor, it heats up and in turn heats the helium that's inside the test tube. The superfluid component then flows through the super leak in response to the higher temperature and causes a level inside the, inside the test tube to rise. When the effect of the pressure difference due to the rise in the level is balanced by the effect of the temperature difference, the flow comes to a halt. Equal current pulses are periodically sent through the resistor, giving equal heat increments, Q, in the tube. This leads to equal height increments of the helium in the tube. Superfluid component flows into the tube and continues until the effect of the pressure difference, determined by the height differences in the bath and the temperature difference between the two, balance. Then the flow stops. When measurements are made, it is found that the flow stops when the relation shown here is obeyed. Delta P and delta T are the pressure and temperature differences between the tube and the bath. Rho is the density of superfluid helium, and S is its entropy per unit mass. But this is precisely the condition that the Gibbs thermodynamic potential of the tube is equal to that of the bath. Thus, we've discovered that the superfluid component flows in response to differences in Gibbs thermodynamic potential. We can write the second relation shown on the blackboard. Here, delta M is the mass of superfluid helium, which enters with each current pulse. S is the entropy per unit mass of superfluid helium, and S sub S is the entropy per unit mass of the superfluid component. We can measure Q and delta M. We know T and we know S. And when we solve for S sub S, we find that it is always identically zero. This remarkable result means that the superfluid component is a completely ordered system a quantum fluid. The peculiar effects we are demonstrating are macroscopic quantum phenomena. In the previous demonstration, the top of the container was not completely closed. It had a tiny hole in it, and when the level got high enough, helium squirted out in a fountain. When we drive the resistor in such a superfluid fountain with music, we get the final demonstration of the film. In this case, the top of the container has six small holes instead of one. We close the film on a lighter musical note, which features John Clemmer, his music, and his saxophone. To understand what you see and hear, you must know that the electric current which goes to the loudspeaker also flows through the resistor in the fountain. <laughs> Thank you.